right, good morning. My text this morning, First Baptist Bernie, is going to be there in the, the fruit of the Spirit, as you just saw. It's going to be Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we're in this uh, summer series on uh, the fruit of the Spirit. I want you to think about it um, as one fruit with nine delicious flavors. Uh, the author there, uh, Paul, does not talk about fruits, multiple fruits. It's one fruit, nine delicious flavors. I think of the easiest way is maybe Baskin Robbins. You know, one glorious uh, ice cream. It's all ice cream, but 31 flavors. We just only have nine here in, uh, in Galatians chapter Five And my assignment is goodness. We just sang about it, the goodness of God running after me. It's the summer series that Pastor Smith has us in. And it's a challenge for all of us uh, to manifest, to live out this fruit of the spirit that God has deposited in us. And so today we're going to talk about how that Holy Spirit, when he comes in and he renovates and does that reclamation project, he works from the in side out. But before I get too far into uh, goodness and fruit of the Spirit, I want to say what you already uh, know. I'm not here today as a visitor. Uh, this is my uh, church home. I uh, grew up here. I was saved uh, upstairs at the uh, Pat and Kathy Davis's home at Disciple Now in uh, February of 1988. I was baptized in the old building over there. Anybody remember the old building? Raise your hand, please. Any of us old timers? Yeah. I was baptized by Mark C. Fowler in the old building uh, over there. Uh, this church, you guys, uh, this church family that I'm looking at right now, we're so faithful. We're so kind. Uh, Pastor Stahl, you supported me all the way through seminary. You helped uh, pay for seminary, which is a lot when you're a seminary student and you're not really working. So I'm so thankful and grateful that not only was I saved, baptized, uh, I, and you guys walked with me through seminary, uh, but the way that you've loved my family. Uh, my mom went home to heaven in May of 2015. She served over here in First Baptist Bernie's uh, children's ministry for a number of years, and the way that uh, you guys, along with Pastor Harkrider and Pastor Metters, I see sitting right over here, Mike, loved and served my family. I don't get back here as often as I would like, and so it goes without saying that this is a special day for me, and I just want you to know how grateful and thankful I am uh, to be here to Pastor Smith and all of you. So that being said, Let's talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Goodness, I was telling Pastor Cook earlier when we got together, there's a lot of them that are a lot easier, right? I mean, love, joy, peace. I mean, we all kind of know what that is. It's all through the scripture. But goodness, I mean, we sing about it on Santa Claus. You know, it's coming to town, so you better be good for goodness sakes. Or we go to a funeral and we say he was a good man or he was a good woman. Goodness can be one of those elusive virtues that's, unmistakable when you see it, but it can oftentimes be hard uh, to articulate. Uh, so I've got, that's my assignment. It's goodness and it's going to be great. And we're going to have a great time looking in the, we're going to take a little Bible safari and find out what God says about it. But from the outset, I just want to parenthetically, if I was doing this whole, if I had time to, to, uh, to do this whole series, I want you to know that these nine fruits of the spirit, they break down very simply um, I don't know if Ron Smith is here, but this might be a great idea for our men's retreat uh, that we do in February. But the fruit of the Spirit, it breaks down into three. The first three, they're going to be on the screen. Countenance, conduct, and character. These nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit, they go under each one of them. The first one is countenance, love, joy, and peace. This is about your relationship with God. Countenance, your relationship with God. You can see it. Go ahead and move on to that next screen. Uh, on your face. It's about your relationship with God. I think about my own mom that I mentioned a moment ago. You didn't have to wonder if Suzanne Shivers had the Holy Spirit in her. You could just look at her face and she would smile and, and she would grin. She would have that twinkle in her eye. Many of you have that same thing. It's your relationship with God that brightens your countenance. And you can see it right from the jump. Many of you think about other people in your life that, that you know walk with God. 
and they are close in their intimacy with God. That Holy Spirit, that fruit of love, joy, and peace is seen on their countenance. The second, see, there is conduct. It's in your relationship with others. Patience, kindness, and goodness. Those are the next three right there. And, and in your relationship with others, I just challenge you this morning, quick question. How are you doing in your relationship with others? Just a little self-inventory. Are you exhibiting and demonstrating patience and kindness and goodness? If, if we were just having a, a little moment of transparency here, I think patience is probably my biggest one of these that I struggle with. And I'm sure there are a couple of other guys in here that would identify with that. Um, I'm not, we're not asking for any kind of, no confessional time, okay? But in the quietness of your own heart, just a little bit of self-inventory. Are people attracted to you when they see you coming or are they running from you, right? All right, and it's, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Are you patient? Are you kind? And, and we're gonna dive into goodness here in just a moment, but just lastly, as an overview, this is all introduction, Countenance, conduct, and then character. The fruit of the Spirit is manifest in our character and our relationship with ourself through faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of us have this daily self-life that we have to manage in our walk with God. And it manifests through just being faithful to what God is calling you to, to being faithful to your spouse, being faithful to your children, being faithful to your grandchildren, being faithful to your church to show up week in and week out and to serve and to give of your time and your talent and your treasure. Are you staying faithful? Are you gentle? And I always think about that self-control in Ephesians 5.18 where Paul tells the early church there at Ephesus, be not controlled with the wine for that is debauchery, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Be full of the Holy Spirit. Don't let any substance alcohol, drugs, man-made materialism, food. Don't let anything in this world control or have dominion or dominance over you. As a follower of Christ Jesus, you are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Everybody say amen and shake your heads. Man, this, we gotta, we're, I might make y'all stand up and do some jumping jacks in just a second <laughs> if you don't start talking back to me because we're going to wake up this morning either the easy way or the hard way, Pastor Cook. Um, but that's it, all nine, countenance, conduct, and character. That's, that's, the holy, that's the whole fruit of the Spirit. We could wrap it up and give an invitation and just get out of here at 9.30, but, uh, but I got more. Well, my one fruit that I've got to talk about is goodness. Just a quick definition of terms. Uh, this is one of the best definitions I found of goodness. It is moral and spiritual excellence. It means to live without guile or beyond reproach. I love what Sir Francis Bacon said about goodness in this quote. He said, of all virtues and dignities of the mind, goodness is the greatest. Everybody say goodness. Goodness is the greatest. Being the character of the deity and without it, man is a dizzy, mischievous, wretched thing. You see, goodness did not, does not just happen naturally. We're not born with goodness inside of us. To the contrary, the psalmist says in, in Psalm 51 that I was born in sin, conceived in iniquity. I didn't have to teach Jackson, Julia, Audrey, or Truett Shivers, my, my four kids, Rose. I didn't have to teach them how to be selfish or how to be disrespectful or how to lie or how to take things from their siblings. That, that's what comes natural. It's sin, rebellion, brokenness. It's you, it's me. It's the universal problem with man. And, and, and so it's not, goodness is not a natural quality. It's not something that we can produce internally or on our own. It comes only from God by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. Jesus said it this way in Mark 10, 18, when he was responding to the rich young ruler, uh, he had called him good teacher. And Jesus in Mark 10, 18, he said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So just from the outset, when we begin this, this dive into what goodness is, this fruit of the Spirit, I mean, it's pretty sobering, is it not? When Jesus, God's one and only Son, the incarnate Son of God, God in the flesh, when he says, why do you call me good? Even he deflects praise of man and saying that he's good. He says, there's only one that's good, and it's God alone. And so our only hope 
of living a life of goodness. And I would even say, parenthetically, all other eight of those fruits of the Spirit, it's all Jesus. It's all the Spirit of God. It's only by him and through him that we have the capacity or the ability to live this good life. Amen? So it's, it's, it's goodness that comes from God by God. Galatians 6.10, Paul said it this way in his challenge to the church at Galatia. And here's my, my challenge for us this morning. Galatians 6.10, Paul said, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Everybody say, do good. That's our, that's our exhortation. That's our challenge this morning, church family. Is we're going to take this fruit of the Spirit that God has planted in us, and we're going to go do good to others. Just like we sang in that song. His goodness is running after me day after day, hour by hour, moment. So, so our challenge as we leave here today is that we would be running after a dark and, and wicked and rebellious world with this same goodness that he's put in us. They, this world needs the goodness of God, amen? It needs it. And so we're meeting in here, we're in the huddle, we're game planning, we're looking at the chalkboard, we're looking into God's word, and we're gonna take instruction and then we're gonna go out there. And we're going to run after this world, as Paul says in Galatians 6.10, and has every opportunity, any door that God opens, we're going to do good to our fellow man. We're going to love, we're going to serve, we're going to sacrifice. And so here's, here's the solution. Here is, here's where it comes from. What does the Bible mean by goodness and this fruit of the Holy Spirit? The good news is that God hasn't hidden this truth from us, but it's in the Old Testament, tucked in a corner of the minor prophets in the very latter part of the Old Testament in Micah 6, 8. It's going to be on the screen here behind me. I want you to, to read it uh, after uh, along with me or, or just quietly there in your pew, your uh, hard copy, your tablet, phone. It's kind of hard to get used to all these little devices. I'm a low-tech guy. Don, I keep it low-tech. I love to stay with the people, um, but just getting a copy of your word and, and follow along in Micah 6, 8. Um, it's been called by some Bible scholars the greatest, one of the greatest verses in all of the Old Testament. I would encourage you to memorize, write this verse down, uh, put it uh, in your car, on your dashboard, by your speedometer, on your mirror, any place that catches your eye uh, routinely throughout your day. Micah 6, 8. People ask all the time, what's good? What's good? What's going on? What's going down? What's up? What's good? Here's what goodness is. Micah 6, 8. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Question mark. Micah asks the question rhetorically. He has the answer to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Just repeat this after me. Act justly. Love mercy, walk humbly. Okay, you guys build, you guys didn't start off real strong, all right? But you built, uh, uh, like just there was a little momentum that we got going there, Jim. And so I'm gonna need you to come a little stronger on this one, all right? We're gonna do it one more time. Repeat this after me. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. So the first exhortation from Micah, great job. I'm gonna give you guys two claps. You did a good job. The first one is act justly. It's the word justice. Justice in the Hebrew is the word mishpat. It's kind of a fun word to say. Just say it after me, mishpat. That's the Hebrew word for justice. It means God is just. Justice means treating people right because you know God. That's what justice literally means. It means to treat people right because you know and have a relationship with God. It's the word in the Old Testament, mishpat, that is most often used in, throughout the Old Testament in describing the character of God. He is a God of justice, which simply means that he is fair and righteous in all of his dealings. He gives to each one of us exactly which, that which we deserve. He gives us, uh, by his character, by his nature, what we don't deserve in sending his own son. Jesus, we didn't deserve Jesus, but he mercifully gave Jesus to us. He is a God of justice who loves infin infinitely and unconditionally. But right now, as we talk about acting justly, this word mishpat, there are several examples 
in the New Testament and throughout the Bible of what this God of justice asks and requires of you. He tells us to care for the poor. He tells us in James 1, 28 and 29, to look after widows and orphans. This is pure and undefiled religion. Keep yourself unpolluted by the world and look after widows and orphans. I was telling Pastor Cook earlier this morning just how much this church has meant to me as, as you walked with my family through my mom's home going uh, to heaven. And then, you know, we talk about widows a lot in that James 1 passage, and we think about older ladies without a husband. But my dad uh, loved and served my mom for 48 years, and all of a sudden he's a widower. And this church and a specific group of men wrapped your arms around and demonstrated justice and love and kindness to my dad in a way that I don't have enough thankfulness or gratitude in my heart to express what it's meant to him and what it's meant to my brother and I and our family. As you've met him and you've been there for him and you've challenged him with God's word and you've walked with my father, it means looking after widows and orphans and widowers. Justice means speaking the truth. It means telling the truth, even when it's hard. It means paying a fair wage. It means living an honest life. No cheating, no extortion, no taking advantage of those that are vulnerable or needy. Justice means treating people right because you know God. Say justice. That's the first thing. That's the first of three key components of living a life that's full of the fruit of goodness. The second one is mercy. Everybody say mercy. Mercy is the Hebrew word chesed. You kinda, if you're going to speak Hebrew, you kind of have to get aggressive and uh, you kind of have to lean into it. I mean, I can't even say chesed on my heels. All right. Uh, I've been to Israel a couple times and any conversation you have with a person in Hebrew, not that there's anything coming back on my side, but I've watched the people talk in Hebrew and they're, they're just really aggressive. And uh, it's fun to see if you ever get a chance to go over to Israel, do it, even just, just for the conversations in Hebrew. But the Hebrew word is hesed and it means loyal or patient love. It's also translated, uh, love endures forever. There's an entire psalm. Think about this concept of the mercy of God. Micah tells us, here's what goodness is, acting justly, loving mercy. Think about the mercy of God and how powerful it was. There's an entire psalm, Psalm 136, uh, that the psalmist wrote, wrote, and it starts out, he, he just said, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. Give thanks to him alone who does great wonders. His love endures forever. After every statement, his love endures forever. He spread out the earth. Uh, he gave us the great light, the sun to govern the day. He gave us the moon and the stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. It's like this concept. If you, if you flip over to 136, it's like this concept of God's mercy just so overwhelmed the psalmist. That he said, I've got to write an entire song and every line, every, every blessing, every characteristic, every trait of God that blows him away, he just says, mercy, mercy, mercy. I don't know if you've ever been at a point in your life, I know I have, where the mercy of God was all I had to hang on to. Whether I had blown it or I was in a ditch or I was sideways with my wife, you name it, I've done them all. And it was just the mercy of God that kept me going for another day, another hour, another moment. And that's what the psalmist says right here. It's the mercy, the hesed, the loyal, patient love of God. That is the second component of the goodness of God. So think about it in your life. Here's what mercy is. It's doing unto others as God has done unto you. That's mercy. It sounds a lot like the golden rule, right? Like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But look, we got to take ourselves out of that equation because we're sinful, broken. We already said that from the beginning. We're, we're stained with sin and wretchedness. Mercy is doing unto others as God has done unto you. So I want you to think about that in the context of your life. How, how has God treated you? Treat others that way. How has God blessed you. 
Go bless someone else in like fashion. How has God forgiven you? Is there something that you're holding on to? Is there something you're holding over someone else's head? That God forgave you, who are you to not forgive your brother or your sister? Who are you? Who am I? How many times did Jesus say to forgive our brothers? Seven times? No, 70 times seven. And it was just a, 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 a number that he said like over and over. It was to no end. How has God forgiven you? Forgive us. How has God lifted you up? Go lift up, go edify, go encourage someone today because of the mercy of God that's lifted and has blessed and encouraged you. How has God overlooked your faults? Find someone that's offended you or hurt you or, mis- or, or, or spoken out of turn against you and go encourage them, bless them, forgive them, overlook the things that they've done to you. Mercy can also be translated there in the Old Testament as simply lovely or beautiful. And so as we in the family of God running after this dark and broken world and culture in which we live, when we extend mercy to others, it's lovely and it's beautiful. And people will think we are, as God's children, lovely and beautiful. And they'll be attracted. There'll be a winsomeness. There'll be something that makes them want to know, what is it? What is it that makes Mike act this way? How, how can he respond this way? And we'll have a beautiful opportunity and an open door by the mercy of God to introduce and share with people the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. Everybody say mercy. Mercy. So it's justice, it's mercy. And then the final component that Micah challenged us there in the Old Testament to live out in the goodness of God, what is good, is humility. Everybody say humility. Humility. Humility, and it's the Hebrew word that means modestly or carefully. That's what humility is. It's modest and care and caution. It's having a right view of yourself because you have a right view of God. And again, much like goodness, I think humility is one of those things that's uh, very, it's, it's one of those characteristics that can be difficult to articulate if you were to ask me to define humility. But it's unmistakable when I see it. And I bet many of you would agree, yeah, that you, it's sometimes hard to conjure up a definition with words, but when you see it, you're like, man, that's a humble dude. That's a lady who walks in humility. And I would argue that it's one of the most attractive characteristics of a human being is humility. And it's part of the goodness Of God. That's what humility is. It's an attitude that's the opposite of pride. Pride comes when we have too large a view of ourselves and and a too small a view of God. That's what pride is. C.S. Lewis called pride the origin of every sin in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, Every sin that you and I commit, If you were to trace them back down through those tributaries to their source, the genesis of every sin that you and I have ever committed comes from pride. It comes from pride. It's an aggrandized, elevated, lifted view of self and a minimalized, reduced view of God. That's what pride is. When your God is big, though, when God is big, I'm small and pride becomes impossible. When God is big and I'm small and I'm not on the throne of my life and I'm not trying to captain every shot and I'm not trying to run every little detail and be in control, um, I like to be in control. uh, And and it's a struggle. Uh, But but I'm I'm not. At the end of the day, it's, it's not about me. I was in a Bible study just recently and I was talking about uh, this fruit of the spirit. I was talking, I, I, it was this last week coming up here and asking some guys to pray for me that I was going to be sharing with you guys, my old home church, so excited about coming home here and, and standing in for Pastor Smith. And we were talking about humility. And my buddy Sam said, in only a way Sam could do, I mean, he's bald and he has like, a, he carries a gun and he has like US flags and like, 
crazy Trump stickers all over his truck. I mean, he's, he's awesome. He's an amazing dude. But Sam just looked right at me and he said, he said, you know what humility is, shivers? And I said, please enlighten me, Sam. He said, it's not being cocky. Just three words, not being cocky. And in that moment, it cut me to my core because I thought about coming here and, and I think about my first 18 years of growing up Mike and Suzanne Shivers' house at 329 Bentwood Drive back behind Bernie Greyhound High School, uh, the original, the one and only high school. I know we probably have some <laughs> champion people in here, but I mean, come on, it's Bernie High. And uh, my life was not marked by humility. I was very arrogant and cocky. And I loved myself way more than I loved Jesus and God. And in that moment, when he said not being cocky, I thought, man, I almost, I feel like I owe the whole church like an apology. I mean, part of my playing basketball and trying to be good, I made, I made excuses for like, I have, to, I have to be in control. I got to run this. They need me to score this, this, this. I got to dominate this game. If I don't, we're not going to win. And it was just this terrible cycle. And, um, and there are times when I'm ashamed at some of the things that I did and the way that I lived here. And so the mercy, Psalm 136 over and over. I said, it's this the mercy of God that reached into my darkness at 21 years of age in October of 1993 on that campus at SMU when God said, you've run far enough, David. That's long enough. This God who arrested my heart in the spring of 1988 at Pat and Kathy Davis's house upstairs, he came running after me. He came running after me and he said, that's enough. I got a plan and I got a purpose and I got something extraordinary for you to do. So stop thinking about yourself. Stop being so prideful, so cocky, so arrogant and come walk with me in humility and see if I don't do something beyond all your wildest dreams and your biggest imagination and expectations. I can do more. I can do more. And I'm just telling you, we serve a big, big, incredible God who can change a life in a moment. Am I right? Amen. Am I right? He does it. I'm telling you, and I'm just testifying. He did it in my life and he can do it in your life because of his goodness. When he's big, we will be small. And, and humility is not about self-pity or self-loathing. It's not about I'm useless, I'm a worm, I'm trash. It's not that kind of talk. That's not humility. It's God made me and I belong to him. And every good thing in my life, it comes from him. Some have more, some have less. It matters not. I thank him and I live with gratitude for him. I'm not going to get caught up in power games at work. I'm not going to get caught up in some rat race chasing after the world and the junk that Satan tries to dangle in front of your face and makes you think it's going to be better somewhere else. Some have more. Some have less. You're his. I'm his. He's got it all taken care of. Humility enables me to be me in Christ. Humility enables you to be you, a beautiful creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The old is gone. The new has come. Humility says, I'm yours, Jesus, and you're mine. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. And I'm going to live my days for him, to glorify him, to honor him. I'm not going to sell out my convictions. I'm not going to worry about what others say or think or do about me or to me. I'm going to honor him. I'm going to walk with him. And I'm telling you, men and women, brothers and sisters, humility is the most attractive trait that any of us can exhibit in our relationships with others as we walk through our lives. Everybody say humility. So it's those three things. It's justice. Everybody say justice, justice. Mercy, mercy, and humility. That's what goodness is. He has shown you, oh man, what is it? What does the Lord require of you? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly, 
Memorize this scripture, write it down, put it somewhere, keep it visible in front of you. And the goodness of God, that fruit of the Holy Spirit, that is goodness, will pour out of you. I I found this quote from John Wesley talking about goodness. 18th century itinerant horseback preacher founded the uh, Methodist church, John Wesley. He said this, read it along with me, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Just a challenge to allow that fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Allow that fruit of the Spirit to lead and guide you wherever you go, all the good, all the means, anywhere you can. And I love this verse in Acts 10, 38, where um, Luke recorded that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. We said this from the beginning, the only way the fruit of the Spirit, the only way we get it, the only way we live it out, the only way we manifest it, it's by the Holy Spirit. It's not man-made. It's not something you can produce internally on your own. God anointed Jesus, the Holy Spirit and power came, and he went around, say it, One more time, Jesus went around, he went around doing good. And that's the challenge, that's the exhortation for us today, church family. We'd go around doing good, healing holy one of the power of the devil because God was with them. The Holy Spirit is in us. We gotta follow Jesus' example and go light our world with the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that we sang about earlier. It's running after me. It's running after me. And gosh, it just, it hits my heart every time because how often have you and I run the other way? We run the other way from God and he just keeps coming after us. C.H. Spurgeon called him the hound dog of heaven. He just keeps running after us. He's nipping at your heels. He's barking behind you. Come back, come back. Quit running after that junk. You were not made for this world. You were made by God for God. So stop running after the world. Come find your joy, your peace, your patience. Find it in me. It's only in me. You were created by me, for me. So let's go light the world. This is the good life. That is the title of my message. It's the goodness of God, born of the Holy Spirit in your life and my life as we live it out in our community. I want to just close with a a quick story. I have four children. I named them earlier. They're going to be here uh, in the next service. Um, I can't get college and high school kids up, you know, to go to an early service when there's a later one. It's like, Dad, I'm not, okay, do we have to go to both services? Uh, I'm like, no, okay, 10.30 is fine, okay. Uh, but my daughter Audrey and I, it's summertime, and it's hot, it's hot here, it's hot in Dallas. Uh, they're all, you know, staying indoors. The fight, any other parents, the fight is the kick. Anybody other kid parents uh, give a witness with me here that like it's hard keeping the kids off the screens, right? Any other parent? It's just me, Okay. Um, but like phones, tablets, TVs. So I, I'm like, Audrey, we got to get out of the house. We're going to go take a bike ride. She doesn't want to go take a bike ride in the middle of the afternoon when it's hundred plus degrees. So I have to bribe her. We're going to get a Slurpee. Okay. So we got a Slurpee on the table. We get out of the house. It's hot. We're riding our bikes. You can almost hear the, the rubber just getting eaten up by the asphalt. It's so hot as we're driving out of our little neighborhood to the 7-Eleven around the corner, feeling the summer fire. We get in there. We go get our drinks, our Slurpees. We're standing in line. I'm a little distracted because Audrey's already started doubling down on me. She's got the Slurpee, but now she's asking for like airheads and like nerd rope and like some kind of candy. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hold her off. I'm like, it was only for a Slurpee. I'm not trying, I'm not bringing you here for a sugar rush. And of course I relented and gave her the candy also. She's a strong negotiator. She won that battle. So we got our drinks, we got our airheads, and we're standing in line. And at 7-Eleven, you're supposed to be able to get in and out pretty quick. And all of a sudden, I kind of see, uh, notice this line forming behind me. And, and we finally get up to the register. And I notice a lady out in front 
and uh, in, in front of us, we're the next one up, a lady out in front of me with a coin purse out and change scattered everywhere. And if you're in a hurry, that's like the last thing you want to see is a lady with a coin purse and change scattered everywhere. So I kind of go into like a solution mode and I, and I lean in and I start hearing her uh, talking to this um, attendant there at 7-Eleven and She's a little frazzled, she's a little harried, and just feel a little disheveled and kind of all over the place. And I just put my hand on her shoulder and I said, ma'am, can we take care of this? And I only know this because my dad eats these. Can I take care of this couple bottles of water and pork rinds? Does anybody eat pork rinds? Could be the nastiest chip that's ever been developed in the history of fast food and snacks. I don't even know what a pork rind is. I mean, it's terrible. But my dad used to eat pork rinds. And I'm like, gosh, if they're going to buy pork rinds for my dad's sake, we'll buy these little, can I, can I purchase, can I get these waters and pork rinds for you? And she turns around and there are like tears come up in her eyes. And she's like, that would be wonderful. I ran out the door and she just launches into this whole story about her husband that morning had had a stroke. They were at the hospital down the street and all that her husband wanted, though it probably wasn't good for him, was some pork rinds and some water. And she'd run out without her wallet and didn't have it. And I said, ma'am, we're gonna take care of this. And I looked at my daughter, Audrey, and she's got tears coming down her eyes. She's talking about her husband who just had a stroke. And I said, would you mind if we prayed for you? And we got a line for me here. I got 7-Eleven attendants. But the Lord just said, ask her. I mean, when the goodness of God, when he opens a door, we got to step through it. We're running after this dark world. We want to be a light. We want to demonstrate his kindness and mercy to us. And she says, sure. And so Audrey and I and, and this sweet lady um, had a quick prayer. And when I looked up from that prayer, I just glanced back at the line and every person in line was kind of like sitting there with their head bowed and the attendants had their head bowed. And it was just an, an incredible moment um, that God opened a door and it's, it's in, within the reach of all of us. There's nothing special that we did. I'm just a dad trying to get my kid out of the house and, and get her a Slurpee. And God opened a door in a moment. So when we show up, church, when we keep our eyes open, be ready. God's going to give you an opportunity to be his hands and feet. Justice, mercy, humility. He's shown you, oh man, what is good. Now go walk in it and he'll use you to open a door in incredible and powerful way. God wants to use you just like he wants to use me. Nothing special that we did. When the spirit nudged, you just stepped through and you never know how God's going to use you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. You're a good, good father. As we sang about earlier, you are righteous in all of your ways and all of your dealings with us. It's who you are. You're a God of justice. And you not only uphold a standard of justice, but when we fall short in our brokenness and rebellion, you extend mercy and grace. And you meet us at our point of need and you reach down with your ever-loving, unconditional arms of acceptance and you wrap us up and you pull us in. And Father, it's your mercy that puts us in a posture of humility and then our only right response to the love of God through Jesus, accepting and receiving that free gift of eternal life, the only response is to walk in humility. And so Father, thank you for this word from the book of Micah that shows us exactly what goodness is. It's justice and mercy and humility. May we as a people leave here today resolved, intentionally running after this world with the goodness of God that has changed and touched our hearts. Help us to live in such a manner. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.